of a clinic and we talked about the entities that would be in there and we started implementing that in Access. What I'd like to do is finish implementing it in Access, maybe play around a bit with it in Access, and then talk about it from the perspective of the normalization rules. All right. Um, think of the normalization rules as being like a checklist that says, um, does my database have the following characteristics? And it points out, um, you know, warning signs, I suppose, that if you have one of these conditions, then your database probably isn't designed correctly. You're probably missing something. Remember that when we design a database, the whole process of database design, our job is to, first of all, identify the entities. All right. Secondly, to identify the relationships between those. and to identify and correctly associate attributes with entities. You ever see like if you're going to go if you're going to go on a car trip, you know, AAA might have a uh, checklist that says, you know, check these things, you know, go through and 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 check, you know. Are your tires at the correct pressure? If not, you have a problem. Fix it. Um, does your, do your brakes squeak? If they do, then you have an issue. And so on down the line. The idea of the normalization rules in uh, database design are to check to make sure that you've done these things and you've done them correctly. Because if you find any of problems according to the normalization rules, it means you probably missed something regarding entities, relationships, or attributes. And you don't have a completely well-designed database, just like if you violate one of the safety rules on the checklist, you don't have a completely safe car. All right, the database we had last time, we had, this is our database. We had a specialty, doctor, patient, prescription, and medication table. Especially being pediatrics, general practice, um, and so on. Doctors being, of course, the doctors. Each doctor has only one specialty according to this. That's the way we defined it. Again, keep in mind that, that when, if you're doing this, um, you would need to talk to the people in the organization and really find for their organization what, um, what the relationship is. Doctors are assigned many patients. Each patient, however, only has one primary doctor. A patient can have many prescriptions. Each prescription is only for one patient. A prescription is associated with one medication, but any given medication may be on multiple prescriptions. Then we also said, I threw this one in at the end, and we might as well throw it in there, because um, it's kind of interesting, uh, especially on how it might be used. Um, uh, an interaction table. In other words, if you take this with this, it might cause you problems. All right. Um, and so we might as well create that table. Um, just, uh, you know, as we build on this example, it might come in handy at some point. Last time we got through three of the tables, and we'll finish those up, and we might add a few things. Typically, you know, when I uh, grade your database work, um, typically that's the first thing I open is the relationships. All right? Um, because again, that, that needs to be right for the database design to be right. And if you notice that that, in fact, let me, let me read, let me, let me drag these things around a little bit. Oops. That looks exactly like this. One to many, one to many. The notation is different, but one to many, one to many. So we know that we've implemented the database um, the way that we intended to. Let's go and let's add in some of these um, other tables and some attributes for them and so on. So the next table I'm going to add is I'm going to add the medication table. Um, 
think we also we also said that there might be a manufacturer. So let's go and add a manufacturer table. The interesting thing is if you really took this to the extreme, if you were really doing this in a real production, it would be stuff that you didn't think of. For example, um, generic substitutes for prescriptions. You know, they can, they can prescribe you such and such, but another manufacturer may make a generic version of that such and such and it might be cheaper. So there would be something that we would need to do to, to indicate that this was a generic substitute for that. So, there, there, you know, you could take this even more and more complex. The idea is this, you know, it has to be, first of all, relevant to the problem that you're trying to solve. And uh, again, for this class, we're going to make some assumptions and we're going to, uh, you know, uh, otherwise, again, to design complete databases, you know, you could spend potentially an entire semester just analyzing a single database. All right, so let's go in and let's add the medication table. So I'll create table and that table, I'll go in the design view and call it medication. And we'll give it a medication ID. A uh, name. Maybe a side effects column. Uh, maybe and a manufacturer ID. And that should do it for this. Primary key is medication ID. Um, I'm not paying too close attention right now, but you should when you, when you do your homework to things like, are these fields required? Medication name, yeah, that should be required. So we'll go and we'll make it required. Manufacture, yes, it should be required. We're not going to have a medication um, on here that, well, that was medication. We're not really sure who makes it. Gee, that's not something I'd want to be prescribing our patients, right? So you should pay attention to these other attributes uh, as well. The, the benefit of doing that, again, is when you put these sort of constraints in the database, then anything that accesses this database and tries to change it, I mean, I could write a VB program, someone else could write a program in another language. No matter how we try to put data in the database, those constraints that we implement within the database are going to be maintained and are going to be uh, followed. All right. So, that's the medication table. We need a manufacturer table. For that, I'll just keep it real simple. And just give an ID and a name. I might go and put other attributes in here like contact information and so on because those would be other reasonable attributes to have in that. But in the interest of time, I won't enter those in. You might say, why make this a, a table at all? Why not just put the name in there? Again, there's only a, so many number of manufacturers and would want to make sure that we can create that foreign key constraint. Yes? Well, no, it goes, the, the relationship is going to go the other way. In other words, if we look at our, our ERD, one manufacturer can make many medications. One medication is made by one manufacturer. So, again, in a one-to-many, the many points to the one. So that's why we have, if we look here, let's save this, in the medication table, whoops, we have a manufacturer ID. That points back to the, per, to, the, to the entity that manufactures it. And of course you can't see that. But there you go. In the, manu, in the medication ID, we have a manufacturer ID that points to the manufacturer. All right, let's see. We need a prescription table.
and that's going to have a relationship with the patient for whom the prescription is for. That should be a number. It is going to have a relationship to the doctor that prescribes it. There might be something such as, you know, the dosage. Oh, before that, let's, let's say the medication that is being prescribed. There might be something about the dosage. I'll just make that a text field. There might be a frequency. I'll also make that a text field. And there might be some sort of special instructions, you know, like take it with, with food or, or whatever. Lastly, there might be, uh, the, the, the last table that we said we would have is an interaction table. And we'll create this now just because it's kind of neat. We might be able to write some later on. Uh, I think I'm going to use this example uh, for a while. We might vary it up and pick another example at some point. But um, it might be neat to write some queries that will look at an interaction. In other words, you put in a medication, it'll show you a list of the, the uh, interactions. And then maybe a description of exactly what the what the medication what the interaction does. All right. We can now go and build the relationships. Now again, there will be three reasons why we might get an error with this. So there could be three reasons. One is if we have any of these tables open on another screen, and we don't and no one else is accessing our access file, so no one else is going to be making a change to it. So we should be okay, all right? Uh, a table has to be exclusively open to make uh, a foreign key on it, which makes sense. You don't want someone messing around changing the, the parameters of what's in a table while you're trying to make a key for it. That just doesn't sound like a good idea, all right? So we shouldn't have that problem. The other possibility is that, or, or one of the other possibilities is that we have bad data already in the table. In other words, we have a or we have a medication that doesn't have a valid manufacturer number. Well, we should have taken care of that, right? Or uh, we shouldn't have that issue because we haven't entered any data yet. All right, so we should have taken care of that one by just the fact that we're establishing our relationships before we enter data, which is a good idea to do, right? Otherwise, you're liable to enter some bogus data in and then have trouble creating your relationships. Lastly, the, the one thing, the only thing that I could see possibly in this example going wrong is if I have a wrong uh, matchup between the data types. If I have a text trying to match up with a number. I think I did it all right, but we'll find out now, won't we? <laughs> all right. So let's go here, and I'm going to say show table, and I'm going to pick the tables that we have not already seen, which is interaction, manufacture, medication, prescription and add them, all right. I'm going to attempt to, to lay this out like like I have on the paper. And then we need to just start making keys. And we can drag things in, in either direction. doesn't really matter. It's smart enough to know how to make the one to many because 
when well, we're going to match a field in one table with the primary key in another table. Well, where it maps to a primary key, that primary key size is going to have a 1 associated with it, right? Because any given value for a primary key can only have one value. So if I go and I drag patient ID over to patient ID and say enforce referential integrity and click create, it knows that since I'm matching to the patient ID that there can only be one patient that I'm matching to. So this is a one-to-many relationship. Because patient ID is not the entire primary key in this table, it knows that there could be many in there, right? You could have prescription one for patient one, prescription two for patient one. Manufacturer ID matches with manufacturer ID. Doctor matches with doctor. And finally, medication matches with medication. All right. It is important to establish uh, the foreign key relationship and to say to enforce the referential integrity because that's really the important part. If you don't do that, you really don't have a foreign key relationship. You really don't um, because you can put bogus data in. Now, the one thing to notice is you're always going from something to someone's primary key. All right. You can't match two attributes in, in tables that are not the primary key. It mu it's not going to be the primary key in one table, more than likely, but in the other table it will be the primary key. Um, the last one that we have to add, this is kind of a goofy table. We'll create it for now, but we won't really pay too close attention to it. We'll, we'll come back to it. Is This interaction actually is going to have two foreign keys. One for medication one, one for medication two. Do I want to edit the existing relationship? No. I want to make a new relationship. And it draws it as though there's a second medication table. That's just a limitation of access. Access can't show two lines between two tables, so it makes sort of a dummy table just to stand in the, in the uh, diagram. So it didn't make another table. This table and that table are the same thing. It just did that so that it can draw it. So in effect, we have created our uh, relationships between these. Oh, I'm, yeah, I did miss that. Oh, I, I put that in the wrong place. I went from manufacture to medication. Thanks. Yes? Now, if you would have cut in our data, you would have gotten an error? Yeah, more than likely. Unless just coincidentally those hooked up, you know. Um, because, you know, thinking through it, you know, each manufacturer could have many medications, so there's going to be a lot more medication IDs than our manufacturer IDs. So, Unless I just happened to luck out where they were the same, yeah, I would I would get an error when I did that. Yes. Also, um, uh, prescription. Yeah, I have that between. Uh, prescription ID in your table, you can see what prescription. Okay. No. 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 I'm not. I'm not going to have a prescription ID in there. They will be linked, to be sure, but they'll be linked based on the fact that there'll be a patient ID in the prescription table. There's not going to be a prescription ID in the patient table because what if the person had three or four prescriptions? All right? And you couldn't do, like, or, or you shouldn't do, and that will get to the normalization rules, prescription one, prescription two, prescription three, because what if the person had four prescriptions? You never know what's like the most number of prescriptions someone's going to have. So you couldn't go and set that up. This one here where we have two, medication one and medication two, in a way might be a bad example as we're moving into normalization, but we'll just sort of leave this on, let this one ride for a while. This is sort of an exception to, to what we're going to define as the normalization rules. We made some forms last time to enter some data, and we saw how you can make a form with a subform, all right, which was a good thing. We also saw how you can make a drop-down 
which is a, a good thing, or a combo box. And I actually put instructions out on Angel because I don't think the book either doesn't have a very good example of how to make a, a drop down, or maybe it doesn't have any. I don't remember. So I put my own notes on there on how to make a drop down. Uh, and you can see that in Angel. What I'd like to do now is make just a quick little report uh, out, of these, uh, out of these tables using the stuff that we have um, now. All right. The tables we have now, we have a doctor table and we have a patient table. <laughs> All right, not a lot of patients here. But what we might want to do is, again, you design these tables um, and you should put enough data in it to sort of test your reports and forms. Sometimes I'll have students say, you know, gee, how much data do I put in my database? This isn't a, a typing class, so you know, the intent isn't that you sit there and enter thousands of patients and doctors and all that. But if you were doing this as an assignment, you should have enough data in there to test whatever reports you have to come up with. So let's make a, a report um, that will show all the patients for uh, a group by their doctor. So let's put another one in here. Jane Doe has a doctor of two. John Doe has a doctor of four. And we'll go on. All right. So let's say I want a report that looks like this. Periodically, we'll go over a little bit more and more functionality on forms and reports kind of throughout the semester. Um, But let's say I want a report that looks like this. So I have the name of the doctor, and then it will have the name of their patients. Underneath them like that. And again, we could have more information about them, but essentially it will look like that. Then it will have the next doctor, and their patients, and so on down the line. So that's the report I want to come up with. I can go in and say, create report, all right, and if you do that, it does a quick and dirty report kind of like it did with forms. I actually didn't want to do that, so I'm going to close out of this. I want to instead, I'm going to go to create and I'm going to click report wizard. And what report wizard will do is it will sort of walk you through the process. So if I click on wizard, it will say, what fields do I want to see on my report? Now, I want to see from the patient table, I want to see the patient name, and then maybe these fields too, address, city, state, and zip, and phone. From the doctor table, I want to see the doctor name let's say, and maybe that's it. I then click next and it'll ask me which way do I want to see this report. Do I want to see patients along with the name of their doctor or do I want to see doctors followed by a list of their patients? Essentially because I picked the one-to-many relationship I can either see the many and the one that it points to or I can see the one and the many that belong to it. Well, this looks more like what I want, so I'll pick that. Do I want to add any grouping levels? Um, not really. This would be if, say, I wanted to break things down by state, maybe. Or maybe break things down by specialty. You know, have all the pediatricians and their patients and all of their geriatric doctors and their patients and so on. But we'll keep it simple in this example. I can sort data. We'll sort by name. All right. This gives us a choice of how it's going to be laid out, like this, like this, or like that. Kind of what I drew was kind of more of a stepped report. This gives me a nice little way to format it. I'll pick that one. What do you want to call our report doctor? And we'll preview the report. 
And there it shows pretty much what I had asked for. The doctor and the patients listed underneath them. Now, we could customize this because one thing um, is that oftentimes the, um, how do I want to say, the, uh, the wizard doesn't give you exactly what you want. Maybe, for example, we would want a count of the number of patients. All right. We can go then into design mode for this and add some totals here. Group and sort. We could add group on doctor ID and we could show totals in a group footer. And what that will do is that will show us the number of patients that they have. So I got to that by going to group or sort. When you do that, you get this little dialog. And this is confusing at first, so I would suggest you play around with it a little bit to get a sense of how it works. All right. But now when we go in and run this, we see that it shows me the same thing it did before, except it shows me a number of patients underneath there. If we had a numeric field, um, like salary or um, number of dependents or something like that. I'm trying to think what would make sense in this case. Maybe age. All right. We could, in addition to doing just a count of the number of them, we could take an average. So we could show the patient's average age. Or we could take you know, the total of their salaries or whatever. Anything that made sense for the particular thing. I can't really think of a good example of how we'd want to do a total here, a numeric total, other than maybe you'd want to take average. Maybe you'd want to take the average age of the patient or something like that. All right. We'll go over more and more of these each time we, we do this. And, and by all means, if you have questions about how to do this, either email them to me or, or talk to me about them in lab about exactly how to do these reports. All right. To the normalization rules. The normalization rules, again, sort of form a checklist. Applying the normalization rules to your database is kind of like proofreading a term paper, all right, or doing a grammar check on it. If you do a grammar check on your term paper and it shows that there aren't any errors, does that mean that your term paper is perfect? No. <laughs> it just means you didn't violate some of the rules of the language. Normalization rules are the same thing. If you apply the normalization rules, you might not have gotten the relationships right. You just haven't broken any of the obvious rules. All right. So sort of, in other words, it's like if you violate a normalization rule, then something's wrong with your database. If you haven't violated a normalization rule, that doesn't mean that your database is correct. All right. You still have to compare your database with the real world problem and make sure you got the relationships right and make sure that your data model, which we call this, matches sort of the real world scenario. Let's go through the normalization rules one by one. All right. And it's my belief it's less important to like know the names of them in order or whatever. There's some very technical sounding language about them. But to be aware of what they mean and how to apply them. The first one says, that each table has a primary key, that each table represents one entity, has a primary key, and there are no repeating fields. Typically what's done when you go over the normalization rules is you show uh, an example of when there's a problem. So let me show you an example of when there would be repeating fields. If I had the patient table look like this, the patient table had a patient ID, a you know patient name, address, city, state, zip, and I had prescription ID one, prescription ID two, Prescription ID 3. That's an example of repeating fields. 
All right. I have three slots for prescription for each patient. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with having three slots for prescription? Yeah, well, what if someone has a fourth prescription? What if someone has a fifth prescription? All right. So there's a couple of problems with this. And the chief one is, is that this table would not allow you to have a person with four prescriptions. And, you know, not to make light of the situation, but could you imagine in a clinic if, you know, someone needed, you know, um, anti-itch cream for a spider bite, and the doctor told, oh, I'm sorry, you already used up your three prescriptions. You know, it's ridiculous. You know, um, this kind of design is bad. Repeating fields are bad because, again, it puts a constraint on the table that shouldn't be there. In other words, what's the most number of prescriptions that anyone could have? I couldn't answer that question. I doubt that even a doctor could really answer that question because probably if we had a room full of doctors and each one of them took a guess, you know, one of the doctors would say, oh, no, wait a minute, you know, I had a, I had a patient that had seven prescriptions. I had a person that had eight prescriptions and so on. So you're never going to find that out, and so why even bother? That's why we get to the concept, like I said before, of in database terms, really there's one and then there's many. How many prescriptions can a patient have? Well, we know that they can have more than one. Therefore, we're not interested in the specific number. They can have many. All right? And what repeating fields does is it says, nope, they can only have three. Well, the problem is, is what if a person needed a fourth or a fifth or so on? Now, you could say, not that this would be a good idea, but you could say something like, Gee, we'll put 100 slots in for prescription. Surely no one has 100 prescriptions. All right. Well, the problem with that is, is imagine how complicated everything would be if you had to find someone that had medication ABC. There'd be 100 slots for each patient you'd have to look in. All right. And that would just complicate everything. All right. So repeating fields are a bad idea. That's the first normalization rule. Make sure there's no repeating fields in your tables. What would be another example of repeating fields? Well, if, we, if you're talking a school example, and we had a student table that had a student ID, name, and class 1, class 2, class 3, class 4, class 5. All right? That's repeating fields. We have five slots for them to put classes in. Well, what if they took a sixth class? You know, maybe they're just adding a one credit hour phys ed class or, or uh, some sort of class like that. Well, if there were five slots in there, we'd have to say, no, you can't take this class, which again, wouldn't be a good idea. Um, majors might be this. You might say, you know, a lot of people have dual majors. So I'll put in a major ID and a second major ID. Well, might be someone has three majors. Who knows? All right. Again, the idea is, is from a database design perspective, it's not worth it to try to figure out an exact number. What's worth it to figure out is, is there one or is there many? All right. And therefore, we're not going to put repeating fields in because we can never be sure how many is many. All right? We can be sure, for example, that um, a person only lives in one state, for example. All right? Can't live on, in two states, right? You know, gee, my house is right on the border of Indiana and Ohio. Nah, probably not. All right? Uh, we, can, we can say that each doctor, at least according to the way our clinic defines it, has only one specialty. But if it's more than one, it's considered to be many, and therefore we're not going to have any repeating fields. All right. Here would be another example. Right, here's an example of the second normalization rule, and specifically a violation of the second normalization rule. 
let's say we had a table um, in our school database that looked like this. We have a student table and we have a class table and we then have our student class table. So, it might be the key to this one is student ID, the key to this one is class ID, and the key to this one is student ID and class ID. Let's say, though, that I put in this table, in addition to this, I put in the student's email address and the class name and the class credit hours. What's wrong with that picture? Why would we not want to put the student's email the class name and credit hours in the student class table and where would they belong instead? Belong the student. Yeah, student email belongs with the student instead. Right. What would be the problem with keeping them in this table? It'd be redundant data. In other words, if you took three classes, your email would be in there three times. One for CISS 143, one for accounting 151, one for English 101. All right, which means if you change their email address, there'd be three places you could change it, which means that maybe only two would get changed and you'd have inconsistent data. All right, likewise with the class information, the credit hours and the class name. If it was stored in the student class table, that means that it would store the credit hours and the name of the class for every student that was in the class. And again, a case of redundant data. This class is CISS 143, Database Design and Implementation, for three credit hours for every single one of you. It's not like Golf 101 for two credit hours for someone and programming in C sharp for four credit hours for a different person and then the third database design, right? It's ridiculous uh, to, to speak about it in those terms. There's only one class. It only has one name and one credit hours associated with it. So therefore, it shouldn't be stored with every student that's taking the class what the class's uh, name and credit hours are. So instead, these things should appear in the table that they really belong. This is a violation of the second rule of normalization. And this concept, um, sometimes the terminology is a little confusing. That's why I sort of always want to focus on like the end result. In this case, we put these fields in the wrong place. That is, we associated an attribute with the wrong entity. We put the class name and credit hours with the student class entity, really it belongs in the class entity. We put the student email in the student class entity, really it belongs in the student entity. All right? But in strict normalization terms, they would say that the student email I'm drawing this backwards. The student email has a dependency with the student ID. And the class ID has a dependency with the class name and credit hours. When you say it has a dependency, it means that what do you need to know to know it? In other words, what do I need to know to know a student's email? I need to know what student you're talking about. 
What do I need to know to know what student you're talking about? I need to know their student ID. What do I need to know to know a course's name? The course ID. What do I need to know to know a course's credit hours? The course ID. So in database terms, these things have a dependency on the primary key. Now, when we had this wrong in our first pass, notice what we had. We had these fields that didn't depend on the primary key. They only depended on part of the primary key. The student email depends on the student ID. The class name and credit hours depends on the class ID. In the database terminology, that's what's called a partial dependency. The attributes depend on part of the primary key, not the entire primary key. And that's a red flag. All right, that's a red flag. Because the attributes should depend on the whole key, not part of the key. All right? So that's a partial dependency. Another way of saying it is we put those in the wrong place. They don't belong with student class. Some of them belong with student, some of them belong with class. That's the second normalization rule. The third normalization rule would work something like this. Let's say in my prescription table, I had a prescription ID which is a primary key. I had a patient ID. I had the patient name. I had the doctor ID. I had the doctor name and office and so on down the line. All right, I'll skip some of the other fields in there and we'll just talk about these. What's wrong with this picture? What doesn't belong in this table? Go ahead. Uh, patient. patient name and doctor name don't belong in this table. I don't want to put a thing now. I'll put a no. Also, the office doesn't depend on it. That's like the doctor's office number. Why? Well, those are characteristics of the patient and the doctor. The patient name is a patient's name. All right. What does a patient's name have a dependency with? It has a dependency with the patient ID. How do I know the patient's name? What do I need to know to know the patient's name? I need to know the patient ID that you're talking about. I don't need to know the prescription ID that you're talking about. Right? I just need to know the patient's ID. All right. In other words, if you had two prescriptions, you wouldn't have one prescription under one name and one prescription on another name. You better not, anyhow. That sounds kind of shady. All right. You should have one name that all your prescriptions are under because your name doesn't really have anything to do with prescription. It has to do with you, the patient, and your patient ID. Likewise, the doctor... You don't need to know what prescriptions a doctor wrote to know the doctor's name because a doctor's name and a doctor's office number or whatever it is doesn't relate to a prescription. It relates to the doctor themselves. In database terms, in this case, patient name determines, I'm sorry, patient ID determines patient name. There's a dependency between patient name and patient ID. Likewise, there is a dependency here too. Doctor's name and office depends on the doctor's ID. This is what's called a transitive dependency. All right. I give you these terms just in case you're on Jeopardy and the category is database terminology. All right. It's more important to understand what these mean than to know the names for them. This is a transitive dependency because this doctor name depends on the doctor ID and it's the doctor ID that depends on the prescription. 
who's the doctor for this prescription? What you know? Or yeah, well, who's the doctor for this prescription? Well, what's the prescription ID? And I'll tell you the doctor. Another way to put this, another way to describe this, is the only data from another table that we store. The only table. Or let, let me let me rewind. The only data from a table that we store in another table is enough to create the relationship, right? The doctor ID is enough to create the relationship between prescription and ID, right? Because if we know the prescription, we know the ID of the doctor. If we know the ID of the doctor, we can go into the doctor table and look up and find all the other information. Likewise, if we know the prescription, we know the patient ID. If we know the patient ID, we can look in the patient table for all the information about the patient. So the only thing you should store in a table from another table is enough data to create the relationship. That's not redundancy. All right? It's not redundant that there might be the same patient several times in this table. The same person might have a bunch of prescriptions. That's not redundant. All right? That's just that they have a bunch of prescriptions. It's redundant if we store more data than we need to to create that relationship. So in this case, it's redundant that we store the ID and the name. It's enough to store the ID to identify what patient belongs to this prescription. So this is an example of a violation of the third normalization rule. In other words, stuff in the table depends on things that aren't the primary key. When the day is done, everything in the table should depend only on the primary key of the table. And there shouldn't be any repeating fields. That's the normalization rules in a nutshell. So if we're looking at our table here, our tables, look at the prescription table. The patient for that prescription, it depends on what the prescription ID is. Thank you. The doctor for that prescription depends on what prescription ID you're talking about. The medication depends on which prescription you're talking about. How much you take depends on the prescription that you're talking about. How often the person takes it depends on the prescription ID that you're talking about. And are there any special instructions? Depends on that. We wouldn't want the dosage, let's say, in a medication table. Because the dosage doesn't just depend on the medication, it depends on who it particularly is it's, uh, prescribed to. You know, someone that has a real severe injury might get more of a painkiller than someone that has only a moderately severe injury. All right? So they may have a different dosage, they may have a different frequency, they may have different special instructions. Those are all the things that get put on that specific prescription. All right? So all these things depend on the specific prescription that you're talking about. All right? Nothing depends on only part of a key. Nothing depends on something that's not the primary key. And finally, there aren't any repeating fields. We don't, for example, have five slots for prescription in the patient table or 15 slots in the doctor table for a list of their patients or whatever. All right, we don't have repeating fields. Now all these normalization rules, that's one way to look at it. And again, read through the book, read through my examples, and I have a PowerPoint presentation. But as you're doing that, always remember this. This is really what we're checking by applying the normalization rules. Have we identified all the entities? Have we identified the relationships correctly? And finally, have we identified and correctly associated the attributes with the entities? All right? If we wanted to put, for example, the student's email in this table, and we're putting that, we're associating that attribute with the wrong entity. It doesn't belong here, it belongs here. All right? The normalization rules just sort of form a checklist to say, hey, this is what we want to do, 
let's apply these rules and make sure that um, we've done what we wanted to do and that we have identified all the entities and the, all the attributes are in the right place and, and so on. Questions about this? All right, that's all I had for today. Uh, Thursday, that's when we meet again, right? Thursday. Um, you know, still, what is week four? Still trying to figure out the schedule. All right, I'm doing pretty good so far, but sometimes it's hard for me to remember the, the, the days and all that. But Thursday, we're more than likely going to have an example, whereas I will define the problem, you will work on it for a while, and then we'll discuss the solution. So that's probably what we'll do on Thursday. All right. We'll see you later. I will post this example, by the way, the access database.